Well, yes, welcome everyone to GeoHug. So before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. I live on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal of the people of the Aurora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm thrilled to have Doug Sheldon joining us today. So Doug is a global leader in muon tomography and one of the few people in the world with the expertise to turn muon research into industrial solutions. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics and Computer Science from UBC and a PhD in Subatomic Physics from SFU. He's the CTO and co-founder of Idiom Technologies, where he has led the development of its muon telescope systems. And today he'll be chatting with us about muon tomography using universal forces to unlock subsurface potential. So this is going to be an awesome session. I hope you all enjoy it. And yes, thank you so much, Doug, for joining. It's wonderful having you. Very good. Um, so yeah, I'll just start with just jumping in at a high level. And this is a really high level because we're talking about outer space. And, and the way the technology works in one tagline is that we use the energy from ultimately supernova explosions um, far away in space that emit energy that we can map underground uh, to provide 3D imaging capability down to a kilometer beneath the surface. Uh, and we're using a subatomic particle called a muon to do that. And I think it's really cool to look at the different scales that we're talking about here. Um, supernova explosions many, many millions of light years away, um, sending out high energy subatomic particles at the highest energies in all of space, the whole universe, um, reaching the Earth and penetrating kilometers underground, passing through our detectors in less than a nanosecond, and allowing us to image the rock to meter scale precision um, underground. So pretty neat different scales of physics applying here. Um, and I think a really good way to really approach an understanding of this is to just look at it from medical imaging analogy, and that is x-rays. So muons are um, working in a very similar way that x-ray uh, imaging works in a, in a medical lab. It's an attenuation-based technique where we basically have a source of known um, particles or, or energy on one side of a body of interest, in this case, the human body. And we map uh, the attenuation of that source to the human body and where we see it being stopped, where we see x-rays not making it through, we can infer bone structure or, or other density contrasts. And we do the same thing with cosmic rays. We have cosmic rays impinging upon the surface of the earth. And we look for the, where the cosmic rays are stopped. And where they're stopped, we have higher density rock. And where they make it through, we have lower density rock or or, or voids or other uh, structures. And that allows us to do um, direct imaging of the geology. Very similar um, physics uh, at the core fun fundamental level. And so that allows us then to use um, this technique to provide imaging for geologists and peer underneath the earth um, down to about a kilometer, but in fact, uh, possibly deeper depending on the situation. So let's let's step back a little bit and then dive back in a little more detail and give you some more um, understanding of what's going on here. Uh, so let's start with the muon. Um, it's a naturally occurring subatomic particle that's very much like a heavy version of an electron. So we're probably all familiar with you know, electrons and protons from, from our chemistry classes. Um, those are the kind of fundamental constituents of matter that we're familiar with in our day-to-day -day life. A muon is like a heavier version of an electron, <clears throat> and it's produced in showers of particles that are ultimately coming from supernova explosions. So helium nuclei, iron nuclei, hydrogen nuclei are ejected at super high energies from these explosions. They travel through space, and they're impinging upon the upper atmosphere of the Earth, which is actually shielding us from that, that cosmic radiation all the time. And when, the, when they impinge upon... Uh, molecules in the upper atmosphere, they initiate nuclear fission, and you get these showers of subatomic particles spraying out towards the surface of the Earth uh, at the speed of light. The vast majority of that decays very quickly or is further absorbed in the atmosphere. And what makes it through to the surface of the Earth is about 95% of it is comprised of muons. Um, and those are uh, charged particles that lose energy as they pass through the Earth's surface, and they lose energy at a rate that's proportional to the density of the material they're going through. And eventually they lose all of their energy, they stop, and then they rapidly decay. And so we put sensors under the ground 
and look up in all directions from the sensor and see where muons are preferentially making it through and being seen by the sensor or we're preferentially being stopped and not being seen by the sensor in each direction. And that gives us a direct two-dimensional map of density in a field of view above each detector. And then by combining multiple such images, we can do muon tomography, which is just like computed tomography with X-rays to make 3D maps of density. So muons are a, a passive background. Um, they're there whether you like them or not, and they're passing through you right now. Um, so there's about one going through the top of your head every second or through an area the size of your thumbnail every minute. Uh, so how we use this in an exploration context uh, or in a resource estimation context is by deploying arrays of, of detectors in boreholes or in underground workings. And each detector uh, maps the uh, muons coming through it from all directions. Those muons are indicated by these sort of trace lines coming. And they arrive at the surfaces of the Earth at all angles. Um, and they propagate underground and, as I said, eventually are stopped. And so for each detector, we look up at the sky in this wide field of view, about 120 degrees. And we record where muons are coming from in that field of view. So every time a muon passes through, we record that it came and we measure where it came from. We record its trajectory. And that allows us to build up a radiographic image uh, of muon intensity or conversely a rock density in that, in that field of view. And then we have multiple fields of view from multiple detectors and they're overlapping. And so they're seeing the same objects from multiple directions. And that allows us to do triangulation or tomography and build up 3D density models of the subsurface. So I started with the analogy to uh, medical imaging. Um, I think it's, it's a really good analogy and there's some key differences. One is that cosmic ray muons are penetrating through hundreds of meters of rock. Um, X-rays will be stopped in the first tens of centimeters and we can resolve meter scale details. Density resolution is about 0.1 to 0.2 gram per cc, but there is of course a relationship between spatial and density resolution. Um, larger density contrasts can be resolved with better spatial resolution and larger objects can be resolved with slighter density resolution. Um, and the source is passive, as I mentioned. So that has a bunch of implications. One of them is that we can't tune sort of the intensity of the source. It comes to us naturally from space. And so there's a certain data collection rate that defines the imaging time. In an x-ray case in a dentist office or a medical lab, you can control the source, the, the kind of intensity of x-rays that you fire at the object to be imaged. Um, we can't tune that intensity, but we can tune the number of detectors we deploy. And so the imaging time depends very much on the depth. It goes exponentially with depth and can vary from weeks to months. Um, and we can basically linearly half uh, reduce that by deploying more detectors. So twice as many detectors, sort of half the imaging time. But because it's a natural background, there's also other implications which are more positive. Um, one is that it's, it's completely safe. Um, there's no new energy being introduced into the environment that's not already there. Um, and it also is operationally kind of agnostic. So uh, vibrations, electromagnetic interference from power lines or whatever going on in the, in the area is really irrelevant um, for muons. So IDEON has been developing this technology for a while. We started off as a research division or group at a, a particle physics lab here in Vancouver. Um, that's where I was working when this was being kicked off. And then when it spun out, I, I jumped on the project. Um, and the first thing we developed was a gallery detector. And that was to prove the technology in a bunch of in-mine applications. So it's quite a large device. It was built to be robust, strong as a tank, um, and to really get uh, high sensitivity imaging. Um, but we knew at the very early stages that once we proven the technology, we had to make it fit in a borehole context to be deployable um, at a large scale. So soon after that, we developed our V2 detector, which is about the size of an oil drum. And just in 2021, um, we completed development of our V3 detector, which is a, an HQ sized uh, borehole instrument. So it's a 50x reduction in terms of size um, and a much larger reduction even in terms of weight. So the technology has a number of applications in terms of um, imaging sort of geological structures and focusing really on mineral resources. 
um, there's a sweet spot for the technology where there's a density contrast between the deposit and the surrounding rock. And so there's a number of deposit types and commodities that lend themselves well to this technology. Um, and there's a number of different exploration stages. Um, so it, it's obviously geared towards um, later stage greenfield exploration where you have drilling in place already to be able to deploy the detectors underneath uh, the ground, um, but also in brownfield for in-mine and near-mine exploration and also for resource delineation. So the range is down to a kilometer roughly, and that's a rule of thumb. Um, we gear that based on the sort of target size and number of sensors that's economically realizable and other considerations. But in fact, muon physics doesn't magically stop at a kilometer. Um, it can penetrate even deeper. It's just that the rate of muons drops quite quickly with depth. Uh, in terms of the um, implications I talked earlier on it, it being a passive technology, um, you know, the, the fact that there's, you know, conductive clays or or mineralization or um, conductive fluids or fluid flow or being underneath a swamp or any of these things that may confound, say, seismic or other technologies um, is actually uh, pretty much relevant for muons to last through anything without really noticing. Uh, and that means casing, um, cultural stuff on the surface is, is not really uh, affecting the results. Um, so that, that actually makes it uh, really well suited to um, operational context as well as just um, Greenfield. So um, having kind of laid the groundwork for the technology works, I'd love to just dive into a couple of case studies. One is um, based on work that we did with the V1 detectors with BHP at Cliffs Mine in Australia. Um, and the other one is much more recent. We just um, closed off this project with Arano, which is a French uranium producer. And that's using both V1 and our borehole detectors in Northern Canada. So I'll start with the Cliffs Mine. Um, and so this was a project with BHP in uh, wrapped up in 2020. So a couple of years ago now, and we deployed five of our V1 detectors at about 200 meters underground. Um, and this was really a proof of concept or kind of standard candle analysis for BHP to get comfortable with the technology. Um, since completing this, we deployed those same detectors at 850 meters depth in a pure exploration context with BHP. Um, and that project is also completed as well. Um, but the, the detectors were situated along the strike of about 250 meters. And the goal was to image uh, what BHP knew was there, uh, which was a thin veined uh, nickel massive sulfide that's in a subvertical orientation. And you can see the sort of outline of that wireframe on the background of the left image. And then those upwards facing triangles, those are the fields of view of each of the detectors. And you can see how they overlap over a wide range of the, um, of the wireframe of the, of the mineralization. So each detector um, looks up at the sky in this field of view, and, and we can characterize each muon path that's detected, each muon trajectory by two angles, which are an angle with respect to vertical and an angle that's kind of a clock around the um, north, west, southeast coordinate. And so we can then project that two-dimensional map onto a stereographic projection. And so looking straight up at the sky is the center of that image. That's the, the orange dot in both the three-dimensional kind of view of the field of view um, and the center of the, of the image. And then looking off to the east, for example, is towards the right of the image. And so each pixel in the image on the right is an independent measurement of density in each direction. Um, so each detector then is really sort of 10,000 um, individual detections. Each pixel is an independent measurement. And so we look at the average density in this case, or the anomalous density in each direction, we're mapping that by the color scale. So you can see where it's dark, that's where there's significant extra density that we're seeing in the data over and above what we'd expect to see if the background geology was completely uniform. Um, and so you can see that in comparison to what we might expect from a, a tabular um, massive sulfide that was kind of naively guessed at. And you can see quite good correspondence between that extra density and, and a tabular um, a model. So we then took the data, these stereographic images from all five detectors and we used our tomographic reconstruction and built up a 3D model uh, of the um, subsurface density. And that's what you see here. Um, so the same view again, uh, showing the detector locations. And then we also show the surfaces of uh, extra or high density um, as reconstructed in red 
from the muon uh, data. And in yellow, that surface is defined by the drill data um, that BHP had done prior to us ever arriving on site. Um, so the, the reconstruction and the muon data analysis was done completely blind. And then we compared thereafter, and there's really good correspondence between the two data sets. Um, and if you see also from a plan view, um, looking from above, you also see that relationship. So quite good mapping, um, few meter resolution on that massive sulfide target um, along a strike of about 300 meters. Uh, and you can also see that we imaged uh, or identified uh, some enhanced higher density zone um, sort of to the the top uh, or sh uh, shallower than the um, expectation from the drill data. And you can see a, sort of a gap in the drill data in that area. Uh, so BHP was excited to see evidence for even more mineralization coming out of this um, survey. So that was, like I said, the, the first project with BHP. We then deployed um, further in the Linster area um, at about 850 meters and working on translating that um, analysis into a case study as well, but that's that's in progress. Um, in terms of the, the V3 detector, um, I'll spin gears and look at the McLean Lake trials. That's the uranium um, program we performed with Arano. Uh, so I'll jump into that. Um, the work with Arano, it's a French uranium producer, um, began in 2017 already. And that was with one of our earlier um, field demonstrations of muon tomography at the MacArthur River mine in northern Saskatchewan in Canada. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the Athabasca Basin in, in Canada, there's a unique um, geological structure or geological context where we have um, unconformity hosted uranium deposits that are very compact and very high grade. Um, and you know, I held I held one of the core samples from one of these deposits, and it's like 40% uranium. It's incredible. Um, and so these these deposits are very compact, uh, significant density contrasts, very heterogeneous. So not at all a consistent structure with you know, great um, grade um, non-uniformity throughout the deposits. Um, but they're very difficult, near impossible, in fact, to detect uh, with, with other geophysics simply because of their size and depth. Um, so the, the, the study we looked at here was with a, a, a deposit about 600 meters depth. That was only about 15 meters thick, about 40 meters in, in sort of height, and about 80 meters long. And so the gravitational anomaly or other geophysics responses on the surface were completely um, lost in the noise. Uh, and really the way that they search for these is by looking for uh, correlates in the geological structures like graphitic conduct conductors that may be nearby and then start drilling. Uh, so very interested in using muon tomography because it, it can really map a large area for these deposits. We deployed that at MacArthur River and successfully imaged the deposit there. We then spun off into a modeling study to look at the borehole development and using it for greenfield exploration. And from that, we defined a sort of first demonstration project with them at McLean Lake, which is a nearby mine, well, nearby being about a <clears throat> couple hundred kilometers away, also in the Athabasca Basin. Um, and what was very interesting about this project was that Arana was also developing a new extraction methodology for a compact pod-like uranium deposits where they drill into them from the surface um, emulsify them essentially and suck the slurry back up um, to surface level without actually building like an open pit or underground mine. And, and so being able to identify or map these small high grade pods at a few hundred meters depth um, would be very valuable for that new mining technology. Um, so that was being performed at the same location as well. So we, we deployed that and then wrapped up uh, the analysis at the end of 2022. So just hearkening back to the MacArthur River project then, um, this is with four V1 detector locations um, going off to the side and, and um, above uh, the area of interest. And so again, this was a blind project. We acquired muon data. We first simulated what it would look like if there was a deposit there, assuming the deposit was completely uniform. And that's what you see there. You see a synthetic reconstruction of synthetic data. Um, but if we look at field data, um, you can see again a slice through the from the muon tomography data, and the animation below is showing sections of that density model crossing from north to south in comparison um, to the ore body. And so you can see really good conformity with that. And what's interesting is if you look at the field data, um, the muon tomography reconstruction sh shows uh, elevated density 
um, slightly shallower in depth than in the simulation. In the simulation, we assume the deposit is completely uniform. In fact, it's known to be not uniform with significant heter heterogeneity. And if we look in detail at the drill data, you can see um, you know, a lobe of, of significantly higher density near the top of the deposit in quite good agreement with the um, muon tomography data. So that was um, really good, uh, not only mapping the deposit, but the density variations within it. So we then developed the bore, borehole detector. Um, and I'll just walk through some of the, the details and capabilities of that system. So it's um, about four meters long. It's meant to fit in uncased HQ holes. So it's about 89 millimeters in diameter. Um, building a detector that had high sensitivity and high resolution uh, in this form factor and had low power was very challenging. Um, we want to be able to deploy this in greenfield contexts where we have to use a solar panel to, to power the system. And so we have a 12 watt power draw, which is like a, like a single LED light bulb running the system continuously. Um, and it can run in quite a range of temperatures and down to a kilometer of water pressure. Um, the um, early kind of testing of the data is shown on the right, just from the lab measurements. So one thing we can do is compare the measured muon flux with this detector sitting in our lab and comparing it to the sea level um, spectrum of muons um, that we know from theory. And you can see really good co correspondence between the data and the theory um, shown there, um, showing high detection efficiency. So muons that hit our detector, we see them. And also below, you can see a, a comparison of the muon tracks measured with two different detectors side by side. And you can see the you know, resolution of mapping the muon trajectory is about one and a half degrees. So that means a two meter spatial resolution for objects that are 100 meters away. So quite good. Um, so the, the context for the McLean Lake trial, um, we had six detectors in the borehole down to about 300 meters depth. Um, it was in a quite a variable geological context. Um, and you can see the field of view from the deepest detector going up to the surface. The area of particular interest was the lightly shaded red uh, region where there is some trace uranium mineralization. Um, that was seen in prior investigations, as well as some evidence, <clears throat> although not strongly substantiated, of small pods of uranium within that structure. Um, so the goal was to be able to map that mineralization structure, also the alteration um, in the surrounding rock. Um, you can see the in the plan view the the field of view of the sec of the sensor. Um, so you can just see what a large volume of rock we're interrogating with those six detectors deployed. Um, down a single drill hole, um, projected up to the surface, it's uh, more than a square kilometer. So we um, deployed down, down the hole in a way that was meant to avoid some of the higher uh, radiation zone uh, due to the, you know, the passage of, um, of uranium decay products in the groundwater. So this is all in a, in a sandstone that's highly uh, permeated with water. And so there's lots of fluid migration and also then um, radiation. Um, in principle, that, that gamma count wouldn't really affect our readings, but just to be safe, we de deployed in a way that avoided the really high uh, gamma count zone as measured during the downhole geophysics um, measurements. Again, looking at the, the target uh, per se is the trace mineralization. If we look just at the high grade pods that were, that were identified within that structure uh, and look at the expected significance of those pods in the data, <clears throat> just synthetic data, look like forward modeling, what it would look like, you see that the um, the significance is incredibly low. So each of the detectors is, is seeing some evidence of it, but if we look at the sum total of that, it's far below the threshold we'd want to have um, to be able to say that we'd be able to image those deposits or those small high-grade pods themselves. However, if we look at the mineralization body itself, there is about a 0.1 gram per cc contrast which is sort of at the threshold of, of our capability to map. Um, but looking at that um, in the forward modeling case, we are, we're able to resolve that with some resolution. And so that's what we aim to do with the field trial. And just to give some context, if you would do a, a high resolution gravity survey on the surface and try to map or find evidence of that um, very low density contrast mineralization at a couple hundred meters depth, um, the anomaly size in the gravitational single signal is about 0.5 microgals, which is about 
um, 50 times smaller than the noise floor of, of kind of market leading gravimeters on the market today. So quite a trace signature. So we collect the data over a period of time. Um, we built up a, a monitoring dashboard. So the way it works is these detectors are running continuously and they send their data up a cable to a, a 4G link on the surface. And that pipes it over to our server. And every 15 minutes, we're getting an update from each detector all over the world and getting the data ingested and then getting sort of a live image of the, of the um, radiographic data from all the detectors. So we're building that up over time. And, and near the end of the year, we completed um, the survey. And just looking at then at the, the 3D reconstruction, um, you can see on the right is uh, a slice or a section of the density model reconstructed from the muon tomography data. <laughs> you can see red is where there's elevated, um, like high density. And then a dark blue is where there's low density and sort of a gray to pale blue is where there's um, no significant change in density as seen in the data. And so you can see, um, you know, we're seeing a, definitely a high density anomaly that's, that's um, spatially uh, congruent or correlated with the mineralization. Um, and we're also seeing a low density anomaly both ab above and below that. That's actually, as we'll see later, quite consistent with the alteration um, that's in and around the mineralization. So if we go forward and just um, compare it to that alteration halo, you can see that here. So I've overlain the alteration um, uh, geological model on top of that. So you can see the comparison. Uh, so seeing that low density below and above com com you know, compares quite favorably to where we, we think that geological structure is, um, where the rock has been altered by significant fluid migration during the formation of that uranium deposit. Um, if we look in sort of 3D movie here, you can see that same section view again, and, and the same structures, but now just rotating around so you can get a kind of a, a feel for how that's laid out. Um, and what's also interesting is not only are we seeing um, that high density structure um, consistent with the mineralization, but we're also seeing um, a significant high density structure near the open pit um, that was to the north of the survey region. Um, that open pit was from a previous excavation or, or, or mining activity for a, a nearby pod from uh, more than a decade ago. Um, in our modeling, we assume that that open pit is completely filled with water. <clears throat> but in fact, we know that there's been significant waste rock dumped back in that open pit over time. And so we're actually seeing you know, enhanced um, density coming from the, um, the rock that was deposited in that pit, which is, of course, higher density than water. Um, so that was also interesting. Um, so this is now just looking at the same data again, but taking uh, sections of the muon tomography density model and sliding from uh, west to east. And I'll just play that again so you can maybe get a better feel of that. That was quite a quick animation. Um, so this was a, a really good demonstration. Um, it was a first oral muon tomography project in the history of the world um, and really delivered um, the proof that the you know, the te technology in a borehole context can image quite subtle geological structures. Um, we were able to reconstruct a 3D model of density, um, and we had great support from the whole Rhino team to make that happen, um, starting with the first demonstrations with the V1 technology some years ago. Um, as I mentioned, we have this, this system now in place where we ingest data from detectors all over the world. We have more than 60 systems now deployed with uh, a number of mining companies um, globally and we're collecting data and, and producing uh, 3D models as we speak. Um, there's a number of other avenues or applications for the technology that I, I haven't addressed in this conversation so far. Um, I, I only have so much time, but outside of sort of mineral resource mapping or, or exploration, there's also great use cases in block cave monitoring, um, in, um, in in mine resource delineation, uh, in void detection, uh, especially when it comes to mine hazards or going back to old abandoned mine infrastructure to resume mining and reconstructing from muon tomography maps, the old mine workings and, and stopes uh, that may not have been accurately recorded in, in past eras. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in that, in those kind of applications as well. Basically anywhere there's a density contrast underground, uh, this technology um, has uses. 
Um, I want to just end with something quite different. Uh, so in, in addition to the um, the sort of geoscience uh, applications I, I've been mentioning up to now, we're also working with a team in Eastern Canada um, that's on the Curse of Oak Island TV show, which is one of the top rated, I think the top rated show on the History Channel in the US. Um, and this is actually a project that's stretching back centuries. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, one of the presidents of the US was, was involved in it. And there's, there's thought to be some lost treasure on an island off the coast of Halifax in Eastern Canada. And there's all kinds of strange evidence of tunnels and underground workings um, that are you know, indicative of something going on. And so we actually have 15 of our detectors deployed there uh, on this TV show mapping for subsurface anomalies. And I keep telling people if I leave the office with a shovel one day, it means we found the treasure and I'm off to do business. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention and just shameless plug that we're always on the lookout for hiring for geoscience experts. So if you wanna make as little impact as possible in the world, um, talk to us. Thank you. That's so awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. I really appreciate you chatting to us today.